This audiobook contains scenes, language, and subject matters unsuitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. Chapter 13 8,340 Years After the Incident I stood, gazing out at the remains of the village. There was no bustle of activity, no sound of children's laughter, no voices chanting my other name, only the steady, constant roll of the ocean waves at my back. I was given the news immediately after waking from stasis, not from any previous log, but from Casey. On the wall screen, I watched the recording taken 18 years prior. The tents engulfed in flames, sharp arrows darting in all directions, thick blades cutting into the bodies of those who dared to fight back, of which there were many. As it had been with the invaders, the screams of women clutching their children as they fled were piercing. Unlike with the invaders, this massacre occurred during the day. This time, there were no invaders. A total of 400 lives were lost within a matter of hours. Elena 417 had survived and was safe and protected. Those loyal to Krada had seen to that immediately, albeit at a great cost. I slowly approached and absorbed the long-abandoned wreckage before me. It had all been coordinated, planned for some time. They had waited until I returned to the cradle into stasis, knowing fully well they would have a full 20 years. I felt I was being watched and turned. I wasn't mistaken. A fox creature stopped, perched on a shattered rock that once contained etchings of the great savior protector of the island. I waved my arm, shooing the animal away, but it didn't budge. To this creature, I wasn't the almighty Krada. It had no knowledge or comprehension of such things. To it, I was just another human, something it had likely not seen on this part of the beach in its entire life. Sensing I was neither a threat nor of any interest, it leapt down from the rock and departed. Entering what was once the main square, I gazed at where the white tent had once stood. It had been their first target. From Casey's recordings, I saw the flames consuming the white sheets rapidly. Two aides were lost, saving the one-year-old Amelina. Her mother later died from the burns. I almost screamed at Casey for not intervening, but understood that I had never given her any instructions to do so. Everything that transpired was a result of my actions, or rather, inaction. It began with just one man, a simple hunter in the Northeast named Ulrich. Like Bolage before him, he was quiet and reserved, content with his life and family. A few days after I returned to the cradle and entered stasis, a sickness took hold in his small village. When word reached the other villages across the island, the decision was made to avoid all contact until the sickness abated. And abate it did. However, in that time, it took the lives of more than half of the small village, including Ulrich's wife and four children. One morning he awoke with a seed of thought burrowing in his mind, a seed that grew. He began to speak at small gatherings in the northeast, gatherings that grew larger as word of his new truths spread. Why obey the laws of an absent God, a God that would allow such pain and suffering as he had endured, a God who does not offer any comfort or solace when it is needed, who reveals himself only rarely in their lifetimes, and only to those within a single village? These were questions that resonated with many. As his anger spread to others, he found the will to do what no one on the island would ever even contemplate. If Krada was truly all-powerful, there was only one thing that would draw him from his impenetrable home, his most cherished possession. Many among his followers resisted, for this was a path they were too afraid to walk. But when the village and the next Amelina were attacked, and Krada remained silent, Ulrich was proven right. Krada was a false god, and would not return for many years, during which time they could leave their prison. He promised the people the one thing Krada had denied them since the dawn of their collective memory. Freedom.
The large cave was silent, save for the sound of my boot steps and the flicker of a large campfire at the furthest end. I walked past the black-veiled aides who bowed low, their hands raised in reverence. Outside the cave, the men and women still loyal to Krada were gathered and waiting, something they had been patiently doing for the last 18 years. I reached the campfire and stopped. Elena 417 sat on a faded beige pillow with her head bowed, her face obscured by the white veil. Notably absent was the gold tiara. Leave us, I ordered the two aides behind her. The women departed, leaving only the flickering fire between us. Show me your face. With trembling hands, Elena 417 reached up and slowly lifted her veil. Her blue eyes bore the weight of shame. I slowly approached and reached out, gently turning her face to one side. My fingers brushed against her scarred skin. The entire left side of her face was a reminder of the pain she had endured when she was only a year old. Am Elena worthy? Her voice quivered, seeking reassurance and validation. For purpose? I didn't answer immediately. My thoughts consumed with those who were responsible, those who had attempted to destroy everything I had worked towards. The people that did this, I said coldly, will not die by my hand. They will die by yours. She remained motionless as the great Krada's cold fingers left her chin. The dense trees gave way to a clearing. The small village in the northeast, once ravaged by sickness, was directly ahead. It was guarded on all sides by bald men marked with stark face paint, their shaved heads a sign of their commitment to their new leader and shared cause. In front of me, a line of my strongest loyalists stood, their bows and blades at the ready. Each man was prepared for what was to come and the sacrifice they were more than willing to make. One of the bald warriors saw the approaching threat and swiftly signaled the others. Their response was swift, but the victors of this battle had already been decided. As bows were raised, the air reverberated with the sharp sound of energy discharges. White streams of energy collided with the tattooed bodies of the bare-chested men. The first man to fall writhed in pain. Without hesitation, the loyalists cried out, Praise Krada! and advanced. The automatics in my hands felt like extensions of my body. In my mind, the bolts unleashed weren't coming from the guns, but from the tips of my fingers. More bodies dropped and convulsed, with the loyalists clubbing them while they were down. I felt a smile form. This wasn't like the invaders. Back then, I was driven by revenge and an overwhelming urge to protect. And while revenge was still a factor now, the primary sensation I felt was much different. It was an adrenaline-fueled rush of pure empowerment of truly being an unstoppable god. The scattering men before me weren't men. They were ants. From the huts, more men emerged, followed by women. They weren't shaved or marked and were likely only residents of the village, living under the protection of the new leader. Part of me wanted to fire upon them as well, to punish them for their betrayal, but there were still many of the foot soldiers to cleanse from the village. As the loyalists gradually dealt with the remaining enemy, many of whom were now fleeing with the other men, women, and children, Casey hovered overhead, scanning the huts and tents with her blue beam. To your left, sir, she updated from my wrist comm. I reached the large tent Casey was highlighting and prepared myself. Even without her aid, I would have recognized it through the white sheets. How many inside? I was eager to enter. Casey's beam made another quick scan. Only one potential hostile to your immediate left, sir. I stormed into the large tent and fired to my left. Before Ulrich could even raise his axe, he was sent crashing to the ground. On the other side of the room, a young woman shrank back into the corner, 
her terrified screams piercing as she clutched her three small children tightly. My eyes shifted from Ulrich, who was writhing under the effects of the stun bolts, to the young woman. She was tall and beautiful, and visibly pregnant. Ulrich had wasted no time replacing his lost family. The familiar gold tiara on her head ignited my rage. I tore the tiara from her as she shrieked and cowered, her children crying alongside her. This is not yours! Do not touch them! Ulrich hissed, still struggling to get up. I slowly turned to look at the large man. Like his men, he was bald, his face marked with red paint. You tried to take her? I loomed over him. You tried to take her away from me! I slammed the tiara into his face. Each strike accompanied by the screams of his wife and children. I struck him repeatedly, feeling the rush and release of each blow. After everything I did, after everything I did for you people, you ungrateful fucking savages! I continued to pummel him until exhaustion set in. His nose and teeth were broken, the red of his blood blending with his face paint. I raised one of the automatic weapons, set it to maximum, and prepared to fire when a small shape blocked my view. Popa! The four-year-old hugged her beaten father as he lay on the ground, shielding him with her tiny body. Please, please, no hurt Popa, no hurt Popa! She pleaded desperately, her voice trembling with raw emotion. In an instant, all my fury dissipated. The gun slipped from my numb fingers. The small girl's weeping forced me to back a step. I looked down at my trembling, blood-stained hand. Popa, Popa, no hurt my Popa. My gaze held on the terrified daughter, clinging tightly to her father. I staggered forward and leaned against the nearest pod, my legs weak and head throbbing. My breathing was ragged and labored. My trembling hand was still caked with Ulrich's blood. In my mind, I could see Bobby Boy smiling at me. Imagine the stories they'll tell about us. We'll be legends. I desperately shook my head, trying to push away the pain and guilt. But what guilt? I didn't kill him. I didn't kill any of them. The only people I ever killed were the invaders, and they deserved it. I never hurt anyone who didn't deserve it. I was a good man, I have always been good. Images flashed before me. Countless men, one after the other, entering the white tent. Inside the tent was not an Amelina, but Elena herself. Her long black hair morphing through every shade of color, the shape of her eyes rapidly changing as tears ran down her ever-shifting cheeks. No! I cried out, collapsing to the cold floor. Is everything well, sir? Casey asked through the comm. I weakly raised my trembling, broken face. I felt alone. More alone than I had ever felt in my life. At least, as far as I could remember. My memories were still a patchwork. Everything I knew came from my logs. Was I even Sebastian Wilder anymore? Or was I just a ghost haunting the cradle and this island? I tried to remember that day. The day I first awoke. It wasn't a coincidence I wasn't affected. I woke before them, before any of it happened. I know I did. The pale, sickly face from my dream, the woman who knew about Elena. She had ensured that I did. It was all part of the plan, part of the arrangement. Wipe the volunteers and remove the priorities entirely, she had tempted me. A new god on a new earth. An icy coldness swept through me. Casey, I forced myself to ask. Was this my fault? Did I make this happen? Please, Please rephrase, rephrase question. question. Did I cause the malfunction? All information pertaining to the malfunction is available in your suite. I stopped, feeling another icy chill. Casey, did I tell you to say that every time I asked about the malfunction? Yes, she answered simply. I staggered aside and leaned against another pod. When? When did I give you this order? 8,340 years, 4 months, 6 All days, All the logs and records hours. are gone, they can't be retrieved. Don't bother asking Casey, it'll be a waste of time. For better or worse, I'm all you've got. The day of the malfunction? Yes, Casey confirmed. I slowly turned to the wall screen. Casey, I managed with a wavering voice. Does the cradle store surveillance recordings? Yes. Do you have anything from... I hesitated, realizing the absurdity. 8,000 years ago, or is that too far back? 
All surveillance recordings are activated upon motion detection to maximize archive data storage. You can show me? You can show me what happened that day, the day I first awoke? If that is what you wish, she replied indifferently. My eyes searched the room, locating one of the several small cameras in the chamber. My gaze returned to the wall screen. Start from the moment I woke. Show me everything I did. The looming screen flickered to life, glitched slightly from the cracked areas. Casey provided four high-angle shots. I could see all of the pods closed and running on the various ascending levels. Thirty men, two hundred women. I stepped forward and saw one of the pods unlock and open. My dazed past self, age 32, slowly sat up. As I looked upon myself wearing the same cream overalls I had for every stasis jump, that day from ancient history unraveled not only on the screen but also in my mind. I wasn't remembering. I was there. Cradle, written by Mahul Desai, based on an original feature film screenplay by Mahul Desai. This novella has been AI assisted. All scenes, characters, situations, and dialogue have been taken from the original feature film screenplay. WGA West Registry, 247147. Music licensed from Pond 5. Special sound effects by Serban Matai. For more information, email intothecradle at gmail.com.